the Father is worthy of the praise, worthy of the honor. Father, as we pour out our praise to you tonight, Lord, let it not stop just because the music stops. But Lord, let everything tonight be, Father, praise to you. Lord, we thank you that, Father, that you are in the restoration business, you're in the healing business. Lord, you're in the forgiving business. And Lord, you're also in the sending business. So, Father, we ask in Jesus' name that not only do you restore, not only do you forgive, but Lord, I ask that, Father, that you take the word that's given tonight. Father, whether it's with the youth there at the apartment tonight, whether it's with the children's ministry, whether it's in here, that, Lord, that you send that word out into all the world. So, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we glorify you. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, kids. Are there anything to finish? coming in to do some work uh, here tomorrow. We need to break down all of our chairs tonight. Just lean them up against the wall tonight. So if y'all don't mind helping out, please do not let me get out of here without reminding y'all that tonight. Um, it'll be a huge help. Uh, he's going to be here at 9 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we've got some broken ceiling fans. We've got some messed up ceiling fans. Um, and we've got some light changes fixing to happen up here. But uh, if everybody helps in, it will take just a few minutes. Amen. All right, so how many of you have been able to get anything out of the uh, Listening to God's Voice series we've been doing on Wednesday night series? <laughs> Thank you. At least a couple people back here in the back. Praise God, I'm at the right church. All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about how God calls you to where you start listening to the voice. So many times people think that they need to hear that loud, booming voice all the time. Guys, I'm going to be the first one to tell you that you won't always hear the loud, booming voice. Uh, if you did, every voice, everything that comes up in your head, you'd think is uh, somebody speaking to you. And to be honest with you, the question is, somebody may be talking to you, but who's talking to you? That's the issue that you got to be careful about. And so God is able to use many different venues and many different ways uh, to be able to get you to pay attention what he's saying. Uh, Brother Ronnie, would you mind praying for me tonight so I can get started, please? So a lot of times the voice of God, we talked about it you know, before, Mark Green shared the perfect example about how do you know it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, a lot of times it sounds like your own voice. Uh, you hear that voice in your head speak to you. You know that God is probably speaking to you in a matter. Uh, and a lot of it you have to judge by what's being said. But I want to challenge you even farther than hearing the voice is sometimes that getting started hearing the voice of God is the hardest thing to recognize. Because a lot of times you won't hear the voice per se. But you'll have this little nudge. You'll have this little push. You have your conscience speaking to you. Something will be telling you to do something and just nagging you. Have you ever had that thought that you just get in your head and just nag you to death until you do it? You know, that's not your that's not your wife speaking to you. That's not your husband. A lot of times, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. If you would, open up your Bibles to John chapter 6, please. John chapter 6, verses 44 through 51. If y'all noticed, uh, Miss Stacy back there has been putting uh, together the scriptures in advance before services started. So if you go up there and you see the list of scriptures up there, if you want to write them down, that way you can kind of find your place before the service starts and thumb your, your Bible to it. But I want to talk to you about how God speaks to you sometimes initially to catch your, uh, to catch your attention. In John chapter 6, verses 44 through 51, uh, Jesus, in my Bible, is written in red, so if it's written in red, it's reliable. Amen? So it says, No one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on that last day. Do me a favor and do yourself a favor. Underline that one verse right there. Just underline it, star it, 
text, whatever you got to do in your Bible, because that is one of the most important things. No one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Yeah, how many of you ever been in somebody's house and you smelled cookies in the house? Or you went into somebody's house and it was a home-cooked meal and you just smell it. As a matter of fact, Tay and I went and looked at some houses and people play dirty when they sell houses. They, they like to bake fresh banana bread. Before you come into the house, you smell it and it feels like home, but sometimes it just draws you in and makes you feel comfortable. And that's the way God sometimes speaks to you. He draws you in. He's going to pull you. He's going to get your attention somehow, some way, and you're going to find yourself in a position that you didn't think that you'd ever be in. But yet it's God calling you or pulling you into that direction. He's tugging at your heart. And so as he starts drawing you, sometimes you'll have uh, something will come up you never understand. But in verse 45 says, It is written in the prophets, they will be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God, and only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, that he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, and yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give to eat or give for the life of the world. Now, guys, the most important thing it says right here, and it says in verse 45, it says, it's written in the prophets, they will be taught by God. Now, guys, listen to me. I highly recommend when you go into a church somewhere to find mentors, find people that can help you whether it's in your Sunday school classes, whether it's your Bible studies, whether it's uh, finding your, your favorite preacher on TV that you like to watch. Uh, David Jeremiah is one of my favorites you know, that I like to watch. Find those people that will help teach you because you need something more than what you're going to get here on Wednesdays and Sundays. You need a seven-day diet, not a two-day diet. Amen? So when you get to that point where you're saying, my pastor is not feeding me, well, you're, what are you doing on Tuesday, Monday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? Are you feeding yourself? Get into the Word. God will teach you when you hear the Word. The Bible says, how will somebody believe if they haven't heard the Word preached? Guys, listen to me. When the Word is being preached, the Holy Spirit will start speaking to you, and He starts drawing you in, and He's teaching you, about these things. Now, when Jesus starts talking about, hey, I am the bread. Now, guys, let me tell you something. That's a kind of a confusing thing. All right? Can you imagine what the Israelites were like when he started passing the bread and the wine? He said, this bread is my flesh. Take and eat. This cup is my blood. Take and drink. Well, I don't know about y'all. I've seen an awful lot of vampire movies in my life. Amen? And so when you start hearing something like that, it's really easy to get confused about what is he talking about. But guys, being a part of the bread of life, that the bread gives life. It brings substance. Being a part of the body of Christ and being a part of that bread, so to speak. You cannot, listen to me, you cannot be a part of the body if you haven't been fed by the bread. You need the bread to keep your substance. Um, our friends are coming in today. They're taking little road trips every once in a while. They like to find restaurants and drive out of town and they go stay overnight and they go eat. And so I was recommending them about going over to Butcher Boys in the morning. You know, go have lunch over at Butcher Boys. All right, how many of you know when you find that special place that you like to go eat at? That special place that you go fellowship, that place that you go meet people. It doesn't matter where the food is at, who are you with? Are they speaking into your life? Miss Judy has a group that meets on Fridays. Uh, they go to the smokehouse. Is that where you're still going? Going to the smokehouse and you take up all these tables. And the food is good, but, you know, the fellowship is so much better. And when you're with godly people that can help you, teach you, and mentor you, that's the relationships you want because a lot of times you find that's how God draws you closer to him. So when those people say, well, I don't want to go to church. I don't like church folk. Well, guys, you're missing out on the greatest part of the body of Christ. You see, because each one of us, if you've been saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the grave also dwells within you, and guess what dwells within them? And that is the greatest fellowship that you can ever have, is fellowshiping with somebody 
in the Holy Spirit. When you're talking about Jesus, I don't know about y'all, but I can't go someplace and talk to somebody about Jesus not get excited. Because when you start talking about Jesus, it's easy to get happy. You've know, you got some problems you need to get over in life. You've got some medical issues. You've got financial issues. You've got loneliness issues. You've got depression and anxiety. You get with somebody and you start speaking about Jesus, that Holy Spirit rises up inside of you. And guess what? All of a sudden, those problems kind of disappear, don't they? How many of you ever laugh so hard when your friend at your side hurts? Or your laughs are hard that your cheeks just aren't hurting. Let me ask you a question. What do you think enables that? That's the Holy Spirit. And sometimes he's going to draw you to that place. So many times, if you're not careful, you'll go into town, and you'll wind up bumping into somebody, and you think, well, that's a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. That's God drawing you to the place that you need to be. How many of you ever stopped at a gas station or a restaurant or a Walmart when you never thought you had to go? And you bump into somebody and you wind up talking. And all of a sudden, your day just got so much better. So was it the voice of God that made a big difference in you? It wasn't that loud, booming voice, but it was God speaking through other people that as he draws you closer to him. In the beginning, listen to me, God will speak to you through other people, through circumstances, through thoughts, through all these different things. Maybe you'll read something and all of a sudden it just clicks and you understand it better. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read my Bible, there'll be a scripture that I just don't understand. And the more and more I read it throughout time, all of a sudden, what does it say? God teaches you. And as you understand that, it draws you to Jesus because the, every word in this Bible is a love story from God to you. And it draws you Um, well, we're going to change to Exodus. If you would, go ahead and turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. This is where we're going to be staying for the rest of the night. Normally, I usually start off with the Old Testament and usually end up with the New Testament. But tonight, we're going in reverse because remember, we're talking about how God draws somebody. And we're going to talk about Moses and the burning bush. How many of you know if you go out in the desert and you see a burning bush? You probably, if it's not being consumed, you might want to go check that out. All right, it says in Exodus chapter 3, second chapter, or second book in your Bible, and starting in verses 1 through 4, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush, Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over there and see this strange sight, why this bush does not burn up. Then the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, and God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Now, think about this for a second. Here's, here's Moses. He's out there tending the flock. He's in the desert. And then all of a sudden, he sees this thing. He sees this bush and it's burning. How many of you have heard the old adage that curiosity killed the cat? Yeah. All right, so sometimes curiosity will draw you, will bring you to a place where you've got to come see what's going on. All of a sudden, you see this bush burning here in East Texas. If there's a fire, especially when we're in a drought, smoke will, will bring you running. Amen? You're going to find out what's going on. He goes over there and he sees it. Now, here's the first time that Moses has ever heard that voice of God. Remember, he didn't hear the voice of God until he got drawn to the event. He got drawn to the bush. And then when he shows up, then when he did his work to go over there, that's when God spoke to him and said, Moses, Moses. And then what's interesting, now listen to me. I don't care who you are, the very first time that you ever hear the voice of God, that loud, audible voice, you will not ask, who is this? Because there's a lostness that's inside of your spirit that understands authority and kingship. And when that voice is spoken, all you can do is say, here I am. How many of you ever had somebody walk up to you and they knew your name and you didn't know theirs? A lot of times I'll do that at restaurants when they got name tags. And when waiters or waitresses come up there, I'll turn around and say, Hey, Julie. Hi, Mike. 
And they look at you and it just kind of shocks them. Like, how did you know my name? And then you look at them and say, well, we got a name tag. Well, how many of you know God knows each and every one of your names? And he will speak to you and call you out. And when he calls you out, he is there ready to talk to you. So guys, how many of you ever ran away from God in the past? You heard God calling you, drawing you, speaking to you, and you ran away because you were so afraid. Guys, I'm here to tell you, when God speaks to you, don't run away. Because, man, it may be another 20 years before you hear that voice again. And that's a long, dry spell. Don't run away from the Spirit of God. I will find that when God draws you, most people are so busy doing other things in their life, they just don't think about the voice of God. You get so busy with work, you get so busy with finances, you get so busy going to softball games, to rodeos, to doing things that next thing you know, you just don't have time to hear the Word of God. And so many people come up and say, Pastor, the only time I ever hear God is when I'm in the car and I got the radio on. Well, I'm here to tell you the reason why that's so is because it's the only time that you usually don't have distractions. If you've got the Christian radio station on and you've got worship music and all of a sudden that's when God speaks to you, it's because you don't have any distractions. And I'm here to tell you, when God speaks to you in such a manner, in such a time, I don't care if you got to pull over on the side of the road and lift your hands and say, here I am, Lord. Speak. Because what he's fixing to tell you is going to change your life forever. Moses' life got changed forever because of a burning bush desert. In verses uh, 5 through 9, it says, Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. I'll stop for a second. I'm here to tell you I've heard the voice of God, but I'm going to be honest with you, I've never seen the face of God. I begged and I pleaded, Lord, let me see you. Lord, I want to see you face to face. How many of you ever been at the altar crying and just pouring up about something? Lord, I'm seeking you out. I'm looking for you. What we need to see right now is the glory of God move through this earth. If we see the glory of God move through this earth, victory is at hand. Amen? And so when we see these things, but to see God's face, the Bible says we can't see. We're not prepared. How many of you know our bodies have got some flaws? But listen to me. Your body may have flaws, but I'm here to tell you, your brain and your spirit has worse flaws. We have to be holy to be in his presence. And to be holy means that we need to be listening for the voice of God ever changing, every day trying to become better. Verse 7 says, The Lord said that I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come to draw or come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, excuse me, of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you can imagine what that's like, being in a land of plenty? Anybody? Where you don't have any needs, desires, or wants. Here we are just now coming out of the drought. We didn't have any grass, and all of a sudden rain came. And what happened? Now you're seeing people cut grass everywhere. How many of you know that it would be nice if it was that way all you know, throughout the regular year? But guess what? When God moves, it changes instantly. He, was, he said that he was concerned about the suffering of his people. Do you realize that God is concerned about your suffering? Do you understand that? God is concerned about your suffering. How many of you are suffering right now with something? Raise your hand. Some of you are kind of like doing an incognito, but don't worry. God still sees that hand. If you're suffering, understand that God is concerned about what you're going through. And God wants to lead you out of that into a land of milk and honey. A place where you don't ever have to worry ever again. But it says the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. As we said, God is aware of your situation. He knows what you're going, and sometimes people think that 
you're suffering and that you're going through these things and nobody knows or nobody cares. And maybe you're looking at somebody else thinking they ought to know what you're going through. And then you get mad at them because nobody called you. Nobody uh, sure reached out to you. But let me tell you something. Quit looking to man to deliver you from the hands of the enemy when it's God that does that. Amen? So many times we're looking for man to take God's place and we don't need man to deliver us. We need God to deliver us. You see, when God delivers you, he takes you to the promised land. He takes you to a place that's full of milk and honey. Man, when man tries to help, normally we take you to the dumpster. We're going to mess you up because it's not going to be pretty. We don't have that righteousness inside of us like God does. And when God is concerned and he knows the whole story. Proverbs 1, 18, 17 says, One man's story seems right until another one stands at the question in court. You see, God knows this side, that side, and he knows the real side. He knows the real story, what's happening. And if he knows the real story, he also knows the real solution. How many of you know we need the real solution? We got politicians that are fighting and arguing in Washington, D.C. about what they think is right and wrong, and I'm going to be honest with you, I think Washington, D.C. just needs a total clean out. We need a total ballot movement in Washington, D.C. and get them out of there. We need new people in there, and we need people that can honestly seek for what's the good of the people. And let me tell you something right now, this is the way the world is working. They are not looking for the good of people, they're looking for the good of themselves. But God says that he's aware of your situation, he's heard of your suffering, he knows what's going on. I hope that you'll walk away from tonight, that you'll know that as the Lord starts drawing you close to you, maybe it's to meet somebody. Maybe it's to sit down and have somebody's cinnamon roll. Maybe it's to sit down and have a cup of coffee with somebody. Maybe to have lunch with somebody. Maybe to go by and sit down and visit somebody up out of the blue and say, hey, I just want to come check on you. Remember when God told Moses to pull off his shoes because of his hold on the holy ground? Listen to me. When you come to God, we always say that God will take you as you are. How many of you know that's the truth? But do you know that God will stop you and say, I'm getting, you're here now. You're here in my presence. But you better take off your shoes because now you're on holy ground. There's a countenance, there's this presence of God that we have to honor. Listen to me. God is not your co-pilot. God is not the man upstairs. God is not this friend that you feel like he's co-equal to you. Let me tell you something. God is so much bigger than all of that. And if God is your co-pilot, I don't want to fly on your plane. I want to fly on the plane where God is the pilot. Amen? I want to be in that place when God calls you and says, hey, recognize me as God. You're standing on holy ground. When you take off your shoes, you need to bow down and you need to worship him and you need to accept, accept him as Lord God Almighty. So it's right for God to turn around to make requirements of us to be able to say, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. I've never understood what's the importance about it, but God does. God doesn't want anything separating you and when you go into this place and you sit down before this burning bush and this voice is speaking to you, you better remove anything that's a barrier between you and God. You better listen to him and listen to him speak. There's a secret about being holy. You might want to write this down. being holy is being able to make the decision to separate yourself away from the things of this world and to draw yourself closer to the things of heaven. Your TV, your radio, your books, your tablet, your cell phone, all of these things have a habit of separating you from the presence of God. And in all honesty, a lot of them are good tools. Amen? 
They can be good tools. I, I love to watch the weather in the mornings on the news. I want to know, is it going to rain today? But I heard about that, you know, we got the weather dog here in East Texas. If you ever want to know what the weather is, stick your dog outside. He's going to come tell you real quick what the weather is. If he comes back in wet, it's raining. If he comes back in shaking, it's cold. If he comes back not at all, or if he doesn't come back at all, guess what? It's probably pretty windy. <laughs> I want you to see the very tools that you can have. The news is good for you, but it can also be an addictive thing. How many of you know if you're sitting there watching the news 24 hours a day, you're going to be a nervous wreck? Just quit focusing on all the bad of the world and start trying to find some good. Are they here? Verses 10 through 14 said, So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring up the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they asked me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Has how many of you ever came up with excuses why you can't do what God said for you to do? Lord, who am I? Who am I to go talk to the President of the United States? Who am I to go talk to the Governor? Who am I to go talk to the Mayor? Who am I? Let me tell you something. Quit asking who you are and start realizing who he is. Because God had to come back and said, I am. And so if he is, guess what? You don't have to be. That is the single most important thing because so many times we feel like we need to be uh, recognized. We need to be more powerful. Let me tell you something. We don't need to be more powerful. We need to serve him who has power. And God has everything that you need. Quit trying to think it's all about you. When Moses was looking through man's eyes, he saw this this need to be recognized for something. I don't know about y'all, but if all of a sudden Moses comes up before the Israelites and say, here I am. God of your forefathers sent me to you. Come on, let's go. Let's cross over the river. They would have looked at him and said, who are you? Let me tell you something. Here a God-called servant doesn't have to turn around and identify who he is. God will do that. Rayford, I've, I've talked about this before, and one of the greatest things that I love about Rayford, he came to visit here at the church and said, man, I really love the church. He'd been here for about a month, maybe, give or take. He said, if you don't hurry and find something for me to do, i got to go elsewhere. i got to find something to do. Looked at Rayford and said, all right, you ready, you ready to start your Sunday school class next week? And said, yep, okay. How many of you know God sent Rayford to this church? And there was a time and a purpose for everything. Guys, God has sent you here to this church, and there was a time and a purpose for you. Now, is it to be a Sunday school teacher? Probably not. Is it to be a praise and worship team member? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe is it to be in the children's ministry? Maybe it's to work in media back here in the back. I've got two young ladies back there working in the media back there the, what, three, four months ago. Uh, never thought in the slightest bit that they would be doing that. And now they're back there changing up everything that we're doing. And let me tell you something. I am thankful for it. When God sends the appropriate people for your needs, guess what? He's going to send the right people. But you got to wait for the right people. Amen? Don't, don't get ahead of God. God speaks to us in ways that are quite different, whether it's through a burning bush or maybe it's through a song. Maybe it's through a book. Maybe it's through somebody talking to you at the bus station. I don't know. But what I'll tell you is God will speak to you if you're listening to anybody and everybody. And if God can speak through a donkey, God can use anybody. Amen? Pray for your smiling way too much. I know you might have His name is Jack, amen? <laughs> I 
Exodus 3, verses 15. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. God is the God of our forefathers, as well as ourselves, and for our children. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Guys, when we start talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we also need to be able to start saying that he's also the God of Rodney and Christy. He is also the God of Rayford and Gloria. He is also the God of Ronnie. He's also the God of everybody else. You put your name in, it's a generational thing. God is looking at you and telling you that not only is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he's also your God, and he's also the God of your children, and he'll be the God of your grandchildren. But we have to worship him and give our lives. And let me tell you something. Maybe... You're worshiping God, and maybe you're trying to chase after God. Maybe your kids are doing some spoily things. And you're probably wondering, how is he going to be their God? You quit worrying about how God will be their God, and you start worrying about how he's your God. And then the ownership, the prestige that the Lordship of Jesus Christ has on your life will be passed down to your children. How many of you have seen the Queen of England has passed away? Now there is a new king, and so they're talking about the kingship passing down. The official ceremony may be months down the way, but the official legal thing is he became king the moment that she took her last breath. It's an inheritance, and let me tell you something. The moment you pass away, that ownership that God has on you, that lordship that he has on you, passes down to your children too. And let me tell you something. Don't expect your children to be perfect. Because I promise you, your kids are just as much poodles as mine is. And they'll have some problems. But guess what? God works in the midst of problems. And sometimes your kids need to understand problems to understand how great God is to get them out of them. How many of you have ever been on the side of the road with a flat tire or a broken down car and somebody had to pull over and help you because you didn't have what you needed? Guys, let me tell you something. That act of kindness when God moves in your life, it's always at the perfect time. Always perfect. Uh, as I said this last week, I wished he was a little earlier. But God is never early. And do not ever expect God to be early. Because if we showed up early, we, or if he showed up early, we would mess it up. Verses 10 through 17, Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I have never seen or I have never been eloquent, uh, neither in the past nor in since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will help you speak and help teach you what to say. But Moses said, O oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. He will speak to you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will help both of you speak and teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if you were uh, your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so that you can perform miraculous miracles with it. Guys, listen to me. God knows who you are and he knows what you're capable of and he knows what you can do. And here's the interesting thing is Moses spoke to him and said, God, I can't do this. I'm slow of speech and tongue. How many of you ever said, I just don't know enough. I'm stupid. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to do that. You see, God don't care about your stuttering problem. How many of y'all remember Mel Tillis? Y'all remember Mel Tillis? I used to love Mel Tillis. I grew up listening to the old country classics. And we always used to introduce him as my, 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 my Mel Tillis. But the interesting thing about people that stutter, I, I, we've seen it on America's Got Talent. We've seen it on all these different singing programs. And you'll see somebody come up there they're stuttering, they're all nervous, and boy, you're sitting there thinking, oh, this is going to be a train wreck. 
And then all of a sudden, they start singing, and something in their brain connects. And boy, all of a sudden, they start singing perfectly. They don't stutter. They don't anything. It's just perfect. And you sit there, and you're amazed. And it's like, how can this person sing but can't speak? Didn't God give them the ability to speak? Remember what God just said? I give them the ability to speak. But you know, he also gave them the ability to sing. Guys, let me tell you something. In the midst of all your problems, when you feel nervous and you feel like you're not capable, if you will start singing in worship, you'll overcome your doubts, your fears, your inadequacies. And then what did God do? He said, hey, remember your brother, the priest? How many of you know preachers can talk? <laughs> Man, you want somebody to talk, bring a preacher up in the room. Amen? So what does God do? God brings a preacher to Aaron and to Moses and said, uh, here's, your, here's your speaker. Here is the person that's going to speak for you. Now, guys, to be honest with you, it's easy when you turn around and know that you're in charge, that you have somebody else to speak for you. But when you stand up in front of people and you start talking about what God desires, let me tell you something, it's a lonely feeling. And so God was bringing Moses to a place where he wasn't by himself, but he had family members alongside him. Guys, that's what the church is all about. Maybe you're not capable of doing everything, but maybe God is bringing somebody else alongside of you in church to be your brother and be your sister, to be able to help you speak and to be able to teach you things. But remember, God said, I'm going to use you to put words in Aaron's mouth. Now think about that. What did, Aaron, what did Moses just say? I don't speak well. I don't know how to do all that. I'm not very eloquent. How many of you know there's not many of us people here in East Texas that are eloquent? I watch my wife as a teacher teacher cringe every time when I preach. I'm going to say something and I just look over there and I just see her shake it. I'm not eloquent and God didn't call me to be eloquent. Guys, when you look at somebody like Christy Spencer, Christy ain't eloquent, but let me tell you something. Christy gets the job done. She knows everybody in the county. I've always said that if there's somebody new who comes walking into church, all I got to do is ask either her or Rich Crenshaw, and I'll find out who they are. <laughs> and here's the interesting thing is both of them know how to talk. Be quiet, Reggie. Don't say nothing. Yeah. But both of them know how to talk. How many of you know God will bring people like that around you to help you in a position? Sometimes when I need to meet somebody and I need to find out who they are, man, I can grab up Rodney and Christy. Hey, will you come with me? And they can break the ice and they open up the door for me to be able to talk to somebody. Or even just know who somebody's name is. Amen? Guys, God will bring the exact person to you that you need that will be the right tool. So quit worrying about you're incapable. And just start saying, God, who are you going to send with me? You were never meant to be in a canoe by yourself. You were supposed to be in the body of Christ. Wednesday nights, man, we ought to have 200 people up we really should. We should be able to each and see all these sections full. Why? Because it's not about the preaching. Because let me tell you something. You don't need eloquent preachers. You need the accurate word of God. And if you have the accurate word, you don't need eloquence. Why? Because God will use the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And maybe through somebody else. But God will speak to you. Wednesday nights are the night that you grow more than you do on a Sunday. Why? Because you get a chance to go through the Word and you get a chance to be able to go through it. Sundays, we're so busy ministering to somebody, trying to get uh, the Word out there, hopefully give somebody a chance to be able to get saved. Guys, we got baptisms this coming weekend. We have a young lady getting baptized. If you know somebody in your family or if you have not been baptized, listen to me. Get on up here. I'm actually going to turn the heater on the water. <laughs> it might be kind of enjoyable. <laughs> But you know, there's things that we need to do when you come to God. And when we get baptized, it's an obedience unto the Lord. Remember what he said to Moses, take off your shoes, your holy ground. When you submit yourself unto the Lord, and you recognize him as being holy, and you want to follow after him, God will do such a 
tremendous thing for you and you'll send people around you to help you do what God wants you to do. Brother Ronnie, when he got the chuck wagon from us, he would have never thought. Matter of fact, he not only took the chuck wagon, but he took two horses. One of them committed suicide. Don't know what happened to the other one, but they had Is she at your house? But the reality is, he never knew when he got that first chuck wagon that that would become a ministry for him. That he'd be able to go out. But how many of you realize he can't do that by himself? He's got to have other people come around him and help him. Guys, when you start realizing what God will do for you, whether it's through Dutch cooking, an outside campground, whether it's through preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, or whether it's just working in the kitchen back in here, how many of you know it's all equally it takes the body to serve one another. Amen. Right? As I want to ask you this question as we finish up tonight, matter of fact, I've given you actually three minutes early. Don't forget, we got to break down these chairs tonight. But is there anybody here to say, Pastor, I've got some issues that I've been dealing with and maybe I haven't been feeling all that valuable. And I really need to find out who I am in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. Listen to me well. Look to the person to the left and the right of you. Listen or look to the person that's in front of you or behind you. That is the body of Christ. Those are your friends. Those are the people that are invested into you and know that you have value. Don't be afraid to turn somebody in the body of Christ and say, you know what? I'm having some issues. Will you pray with me? Will you just have a moment just sit here and talk to me and just tell me? Uh, what you see or what you think. Let me tell you something. People speak the truth to you. But you also have to recognize not everybody is always speaking the voice of God. Use your discernment to know what is of God and what is of God. If you walk outside tonight and you see a burning bush, <laughs> run to the burning bush. <laughs> Amen? Listen to God speak to you. But if you go home and there's a song playing on your radio tonight, and it draws you closer to God. Listen to it. Lift up your hands and worship. Sing unto the Lord like you've never sang before. Because your life does depend upon him. Amen. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, we thank you so much. There's so many things that you have done. Lord, just as you've called Moses, and Lord, you called his brother alongside of him. Father, I thank you that, Lord, you're calling each and every person that's in this congregation today, and the Lord, you're calling other people to come around them to help them. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, the Father, that you would touch each person that's here tonight. The Lord, I know there's struggles and there's fights, and the Lord, there's things that, that, Father, maybe they just can't see the end of it. But Lord, you knew the end before the beginning. So, Lord, I ask that, Father, that you would teach us what it's like to trust in you on a daily basis. Father, to listen to your voice. Father, as you draw us near, and Lord, I ask that, Father, that you would draw each person in this room closer to you. Lord, I ask that, Father, that you would wake us up and, Father, give us the opportunity to see who you are moving in our lives. Lord, I pray over this church congregation. I pray over this community. Father, I pray over the body of Christ that, Lord, we treat church not like a community club. The Lord, it's a place where we go to get strengthened, we get set free, and we get sent. Lord, teach us what it's all like. Father, be missionaries that we go forth and speak the word of God. So, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. Lord, we speak your blessings over these people. Lord, they are your people. Lord, I ask that you bless them. Make them the head, not the tail, the top, and not the bottom. Lord, bless them in their coming. Bless them in their going. Bless them in the rural areas. Bless them in the rural and the communities and towns. Lord, I ask that you bless them in their jobs. Lord, bless them in their families. Father, bless them in their finances and their health. Lord, I ask that you bless their crops, their herds, and their barns. Lord, as we always pray, Lord, we don't need more barns or bigger barns. We just need more neighbors that we can bless. So, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, Father, that you would allow us, Father, to come around to other people, and, Lord, that you would send people to us. And, Lord, we'd be able to use our gifts to serve you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen, guys. Appreciate you. Y'all need us? Can I help us load up the computer?